Welcome everyone to our Rough Cut seminar series. As a part of our series, next week we will hear from panelists Dr. Mar Mari Eggers, John Doyle, Vanessa Simmons, Christine Martin, Charlene Johnson, and Tim Reelbird, who will be speaking on addressing water insecurity in Crows. So I hope you all can join us for that. And today I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Libby Lundstrom, who is an associate professor in environmental and global studies at Boise State University. Her research examines conservation induced displacement, more broadly, the illegal wildlife trade, the militarization of conservation practice and indigenous led conservation and ecological restoration. Her work focuses on Southern Africa and North America. And today Libby will be presenting on rethinking crisis and crisis conservation. As a reminder, please be sure to turn your cameras and microphones off during the presentation and save your questions for the end of the talk. And we are recording today's seminar, so it'll be posted to the IOE's website by the end of the day. Um, and without further ado, I will hand it over to Dr. Lundstrom. Okay, thank you, Paige, and thank you everyone who's joined. Um, Paige, can you hear me okay? I can hear you great. Okay, wonderful. Uh, so thanks for having me. Um, it's an honor to be here uh, speaking to you, even though it's remotely. Um, I just wanted to give a quick thanks to Paige uh, for all the work she's done organizing uh, the talk and to Julia and Bruce for the invitation. Um, just briefly about me, I've been at Boise State for about two and a half years. Um, I was a faculty member in the geography department um, at York University in Canada for 12 years before I came to Boise State. Uh, but Boise is my hometown. And the reason I'm saying all of that is that it's really exciting to give a talk to my neighbors. Um, and I've been hoping to develop greater connections across the region. And so uh, this talk, albeit um, one that is remote, I think is a good chance for me to do that to you to get to know me. And hopefully I can get to know a few of you in the, the Q&A session as well. Uh, so the invitation to speak today is a particularly um, welcome one. Okay, so before I get into the kind of meat of the talk, I wanted to um, briefly situate my broader research, um, my body of work, because I think you'll get a sense of why that's actually important to the talk today. And so if I can advance my slides here, um, the vast, vast majority of my work has actually taken place in Southern Africa here in what's called the Great Limpopo Transfrontier Park. Um, and most of my work has actually been um, in Kruger and in the Limpopo National Park, and especially in the international border between this region. And I'm gonna come back to this because I'm gonna talk about it a bit uh, at length in the talk today. I have a more recent um, project that's closer to my home, but even more closer to the home of many of you. Um, and that is supporting um, indigenous-led uh, ecological restoration around bison um, through the Indian Initiative, supporting the Indian Initiative, with, which is a Blackfoot-led um, um, initiative, and then the broader Buffalo Treaty, um, which is a um, cross-border um, group of uh, First Nations and Native American tribes that are working together to try to renew relationships with the bison. I'll be talking less about this, but I think you'll see some um, some uh, themes around an indigenous led conservation that will come in later in the talk. And so um, I'll talk less a bit, a bit. I'll talk less about this project because it is very much in its infancy, the, the Blackfoot um, and Buffalo Treaty project, but I'll talk quite a bit about the Southern African research. And so I bring this up both as a way to introduce me and my broader body of work. Um, but also because the talk that I'm going to give today draws really heavily on this experience of watching changes to biological conservation unfold over the last 20 years. Some of those are welcome changes, but some of those are quite concerning changes as well. And so I want to use the talk as a way really to take stock, to take stock of some of these changes that, um, that I've been witnessing and many others around me have been witnessing as well. Um, I will say, please bear with me. This is very much a work in progress, um, both the presentation and the paper that uh, we're sort of building out of this. Um, and so I'd like to dive into the talk now with that um, sort of brief introduction uh, to my research. So uh, what I want to talk about today um, and what I, is what I see and what I want to theorize as the dual crisis of biological conservation and why I think it's important that we take this dual crisis seriously. So um, briefly, you've got on the one hand, um, the biodiversity crisis. This um, 
you know, we have growing evidence, pretty unequivocal evidence at this for uh, this point that we are in a state of biodiversity crisis. Like biodiversity is in a state of rapid uh, and very concerning decline. But on the other hand, you have this crisis that biodiversity conservation has caused. Uh, and this is a crisis of exclusion, a crisis in which biodiversity biodiversity conservation has excluded local and indigenous communities historically, and it continues to do so today. And so if we step back, one of the things we see about these two points of the crisis is that analysis of these tend to fall into two distinct literatures that don't talk directly to one another, like they sometimes criticize one another, uh, but in terms of um, the main interventions of these two positions, they're not great about taking the other group's main points and main contributions um, seriously as like central points of analysis and debate and so forth. And so the two literatures here that I have in mind and um, uh, literatures and kind of broader conservation actors with biodiversity decline, we're talking about mainstream conservation, conservation biology, conservation practitioners and so forth. Um, and then on the other hand, uh, the, the focus on biodiversity conservation is causing a crisis. This is examined much more in the critical conservation literature, um, but also activists um, who are actively uh, critical of conservation for dispossessing local communities. Um, and so there's basically two camps, if you will. And I know I'm simplifying things a bit here, but I think it's kind of useful to see things um, through those lens. And the point is that there's not a lot of conversation um, kind of productive conversation going on across these. And so that's the problem, that the positions have largely pa talked past one another in terms of their main points, their main contributions. Um, and the argument here that I want to make is that we need to address both crises at once. You can't just focus on one of these because we're not going to make um, much headway. And the challenge is once you begin to see that there's not a crisis of biological conservation, but that there's a dual crisis, once you begin to take both of those seriously, what does it mean for conservation theory and practice? How would we do conservation theory and practice differently? Um, and I asked this question in part um, because this is a bit of my own mea culpa. Uh, my work you'll see fits much more into the second camp, the critical conservation literature. And even for me, I haven't done a great job of recognizing um, at least in my scholarship, that we are in a state of biodiversity crisis. So once I kind of take that seriously, how does that change my um, scholarship as well? And so um, how do we come up, the challenge basically, how do we come up with models of conservation that are both ecologically effective, uh, but also more just, more fair at the end of the day? And so what I'm going to do in the talk is I'm going to talk you through these different positions. So um, we get a general sense of what they entail, what the crisis is. Um, and I'm also going to focus on how each of these um, groups actually deals with the concept of crisis. So not just that we're in a state of crisis, but the concept of crisis, like the theory, what do we mean by crisis? Um, if you do fall uh, more towards one of these positions than the other, I'd actually ask all of us to take um, the contrary position seriously um, and, and think about how that can help us move forward. Um, this won't be entirely theoretical because I'm going to ground some of this in uh, debates around the post-2020 global biodiversity agenda to see that like there's actually a lot at stake here. Uh, it's not just a theoretical exercise. And then I'm going to close very briefly at the end um, with potential ways of moving forward, of addressing the challenge. Um, I'm going to do this very briefly, both because um, lack of time, but also because I'm still thinking through this. And I hope in the q and I can hear from some of you about what you think we should do um, to address this dual crisis of biodiversity um, conservation. Okay, so I'm gonna start here with the mainstream um, conservation literature, and then I'm gonna move on to the more critical perspective, thinking about crisis. So with the mainstream conservation perspective, um, over the last five years or so, there's really been a renewed um, focus on biodiversity and the problem of biodiversity decline um, in scholarly debate, but especially in popular and policy debate, a lot more popular and, and, and um, I think policy discussion around this. And some of this recognition um, that biodiversity decline um, is in a pretty, uh, it's pretty precipitous and it's concerning, um, is coming from a series of synthetic reports that have come out over the last two or three years 
showing that unequivocally biodiversity um, is in a poor state. It's declining rapidly um, and it has really severe consequences. And the most influential of these synthetic reports, you know, the reports that are reading the scientific literature and digesting them, um, the most um, influential of these is the IPIS report, the 2019 Global Assessment Report on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. Um, IPIS, if you don't already know, um, is the uh, intergovernmental body that reviews scientific evidence on the state of biodiversity and biodiversity decline, and then builds from that to offer uh, policy advice to governments. And so what IBIS, kind of their main message in the, um, the global assessment report is that nature and its vital contributions to people, which together embody biodiversity and ecosystem functions and services, that these are deteriorating worldwide. And so two things are under threat here. Um, nature is under threat, and we as people who depend on nature, we are also threatened by this decline in biodiversity and ecosystem services, um, nature, and so forth. And so I just briefly put up this uh, image from the IPIS report just to show kind of more evidence. Uh, this is showing that from 1970 to the present, uh, global trends in the capacity of nature to sustain contributions to good quality of life for us as people, um, of all those indicators, there's 18 of them that IPIS looks out, 14 of the 18 have declined since 1970s. What's really interesting is that the three that have increased all have to do with agriculture. Um, and agriculture, the expansion of agriculture is actually responsible uh, for the decline in some of these other areas. Uh, so this picture is pretty, pretty bleak um, that we're in the state of biodiversity crisis. And the crisis, I think, is really reinforced by the fact that we're not on a good path to th turn things around. Um, biodiversity decline has been unfolding precipitously and it's getting worse and we're not doing enough to address it. And that becomes really clear, especially with the UN Global Biodiversity Outlook, um, their fifth report that came out in 2020. And I love this uh, title from The Guardian because it does a really good job of summary summarizing this report where it says, the world fails to meet a single target to stop destruction of nature. Um, and so what the report shows is that if you look at the uh, 2010 biodiversity targets set out by the CBD or the Convention on Biological Diversity as this global treaty on biodiversity, um, that the world has failed to meet all of those targets. Um, so again, we're not doing enough. We're not doing it quickly. We're not taking um, the urgency of the problem seriously enough to turn things around. And so to link this up with some broader kind of theoretical debates within the, the mainstream literature and popular discussion, um, there have been arguments that biodiversity decline is so severe that we are either entering or have already entered the phase of a sixth mass extinction. So a mass extinction event is one where biodiversity decline happens much, much more rapidly than biodiversity can replace itself. And so um, the last mass extinction, a pretty well-known one, happened 65 million years ago when three quarters of life died out on Earth, um, including all non-avian dinosaurs, uh, when presumably a, caused by a meteor hitting the Earth. Um, so this, the argument is that this is the next mass extinction that the Earth is experiencing. What's different about this today is that uh, biodiversity decline is driven not by a meteor, for example, but driven by human activity. And this focus on human activity leads into these debates around the Anthropocene. And so um, lots of uh, debate and analysis of how we've entered the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene as this controversial but provocative concept um, that we are entering a new geologic epoch. Um, one defined by human domination, human domination of the Earth system. And unlike the relative um, biological and climatic stability of the Holocene, which is the current geologic epoch that we're in, um, the, the Anthropocene is defined in contrast by um, uncertainty and instability of the Earth system, of the biological system, the climate system, and so forth. And so the crux of all of this is that whether you agree or not that we're in a sixth mass extinction or about to enter it or in the in, entering the Anthropocene, um, the crux is that we are in a state of biodiversity crisis, of profound biodiversity crisis. All evidence points towards th uh, this and things really aren't looking good here. Um, 
in other words, we're on the cusp of um, a time in which humans and non-human nature cannot live with reasonable safety and comfort on the planet anymore. And for some species, they will lose out on the ability to even survive. So this is the crisis of biological um, uh, diversity and the, or the biodiversity crisis to be short. Okay, so that's the crisis. Um, and in many ways we can say that's the actual crisis, but this also relates to the concept of crisis. So the concept of crisis um, in the kind of mainstream conservation um, is taken on most explicitly within um, conservation biology. So conservation biology as the core scientific discipline, um, applied discipline that most closely is aligned with the study of the conservation of nature and biodiversity, um, its decline, what's driving that decline and how to address that. Um, that's conservation biology, a really important discipline here. And conservation biology has taken on the concept of crisis pretty explicitly, and I think in some interesting and important ways. And a lot of this leads back to this 1985 essay uh, by Michael Soleil, where he attempts to define the field, the young field at the time. And in that essay, um, he tells us that conservation biology, that it differs from most other biological sciences in one important way. Uh, and that's that conservation biology is a crisis discipline at its core, it is a crisis discipline. And so um, Soleil uh, explains that in crisis disciplines like conservation biology, one thing that defines those is that you have to act before knowing all the facts. Um, crisis disciplines are, quote, thus a mixture of science and art, and their pursuit requires intuition as well as information. And so how um, crisis is relevant here is it really comes down to urgency that the problem of bio biodiversity decline or however you want to phrase that that problem is so urgent that we don't have the luxury of waiting for all needed information to come in that we often have to act on a uh, limited information and it's not just scientists that have to do that um, but scientists are asked to make recommendations to governments who are trying to address this urgency um, and if we look back at 1985 when this came out, this sense of urgency of needing to act with limited knowledge, this is only intensified since this article came out. I think especially as we have more and more information about just how serious the, um, the crisis of biodiversity actually is. Um, and so this concept of crisis is really core to how we understand um, biodiversity decline. And so I want to say here, like, there is a real crisis. Um, and how we understand biodiversity decline is also shaped by a broader concept of crisis. And so how do we act on this? How do we act on this urgent, uh, urgently act on uh, this crisis of biodiversity? Because it is urgent. Uh, what's the best path, for, best path forward? Well, if we look at the global debates on biodiversity conservation, a lot of those debates have begun to gel around the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. Um, this is the framework, again, developed by the Convention on Biological Diversity. Currently under development, uh, the first round of um, negotiations took place a few months ago. The next round uh, takes place in Kunming, China in May. So we're like right smack dab in the middle of the development of this global biodiversity framework. Um, and what... Uh, that framework is beginning to look like, and many of you have probably heard of this before, but it is the 30 by 30 campaign. And so the 30 by 30 campaign is the campaign in which um, the goal is to set aside and protect 30% of land and sea areas by the year 2030. So that's why it's 30 by 30, 30% of land and sea areas protected um, by the year 2030. And so this will include, um, two major um, mechanisms, if you will. The first one is uh, the expansion or development of new protected areas. So protected areas like national parks, for example, um, of expanding those. And then the second mechanism or what is um, called OECMs, which stands for other, affected, uh, other effective area-based conservation measures. And so these tend to be more multi-use um, areas. They're not as restrictive as um, protective areas. Um, and so that's what 30 by 30 looks like. And I should briefly say the US is not a signatory of the Convention on Biological Diversity, 
Um, but President Biden has put forth um, the U.S. version of 30 by 30. And so the U.S. in some sense is on board with this. It just has its own project uh, called the America the Beautiful campaign uh, that really, I think, incorporates many of the main features of the global biodiversity framework. Okay, so um, recognizing not only the severity of the biodiversity crisis, but also its complexity in terms of what's driving it, uh, conservation scholarship um, and practitioners as well have been calling not just for more land under protection, like we see with you know the 30%, um, but also calling for transformative change to our political and economic systems. And um, IBIS defines transformative change as a fundamental system-wide reorganization across technological, economic, and social factors, including paradigms, goals, and values. And so really what this is saying is that, you know, we need to protect, um, we need to protect these lands, do so through protected areas and OECMs, but that's not enough. We need to fundamentally look at what's driving biodiversity decline and make changes to our broader systems uh, to address that. Well, these debates over what transformative change should encompass and whether this protected area model and OECMs are the right path forward, these are um, core to the debates around 30 by 30. 30 by 30 has not been embraced by everyone as the move um, forward. And perhaps not surprisingly, the critical conservation literature has been very critical of 30 by 30. And we're gonna come back later to look at uh, why that's the case. Um, but before we get back to 30 by 30, I wanna build up what this critical perspective is um, because this gets us to the second side the second facet of the biodiversity crisis. And um, so I'll talk briefly about this uh, more critical perspective and say briefly, if you're not familiar with the more critical conservation um, literature work, it's work that has emerged primarily within the interdisciplinary field of political ecology. Um, political ecology is this interdisciplinary field uh, with roots in um, geography and anthropology uh, and so forth that looks at the way in which ecological processes are shaped by power imbalances um, and power relationships, and in turn, how power imbalances shapes ecological processes. So this dialectic relationship between power and ecological processes um, and how those um, are shaped across scale, you know, from the local to, to the global. And so uh, these next few minutes, I'm going to be talking about this critical body of, of scholarship um, and activism coming out of that political ecology tradition. Okay, so what is this more critical perspective on protected areas and biodiversity conservation? Um, I want to explain what this looks like and how conservation has produced its own exclusions. And I want to do so by kind of zeroing in on um, my own research sites and then I'll kind of zoom back out to the global. Um, and so that begins here with this great Limpopo Trans Frontier Park, uh, Tri Country Park that unites Kruger extraordinarily important and iconic park, Safari Park in South Africa, uh, as the anchor um, united with Limpopo National Park in Mozambique, Gona Rizal National Park in um, Zimbabwe. And so some of the interesting features of this park is that um, Kruger National Park has existed in some form or another since the late 1800s, becomes a national park in the 1920s, Gona Rizal um, National Park has a shorter history but still has been around for decades. The Lompopo National Park, on the other hand, uh, wasn't a park until 2001. And the reason it became a national park is because Mozambique had to first have a national park before it could be integrated into the Great Limpopo Trans Frontier Park. So this was never meant to be a standalone national park. It was always designed to fit into the larger Trans Frontier Park. And the rationale for the Trans Frontier Park, but also the Limpopo National Park in particular, um, was to rehabilitate wildlife that had been decimated and truly had been decimated um, in the region during Mozambique's civil war, primarily in the 1980s. So rehabilitate wildlife populations, allow for a release valve for Kruger's elephants, Kruger's overpopulated with elephants to allow them to enter into the Limpopo National Park. Um, and this is also a peace park, a peace park designed to build peaceful relations between these countries Particularly important because um, apartheid South Africa uh, was one of the actors responsible for fueling the war in Mozambique. So really rocky political history. Well, despite this label, 
of a peace park, um, that label hides a more troubling history, uh, an ongoing history and a more um, distant history. And that's a history of displacement. Kruger National Park um, has a very long history of displacing the local Shangana people um, that goes back um, until the early days of the park, and it's an ongoing history. People still aren't allowed to live in most of the park. Uh, in Limpopo National Park, that process of displacing um, about 7,000 people began in 2003. It's still not complete. It's still ongoing. Um, but the plan is to take all the people living in the core of the park along major waterways where animals will also want to live um, and move them outside of the park, either to the park's edges in the buffer zone um, or like entirely outside of the park. And that's what this map is showing. It's uh, where the communities um, have lived and where, where they will be moved to. And I think not surprisingly, the region is um, characterized by a pretty rocky relationship between communities and um, the, the park governance, in part because, in large part, because of this history of dispossession. That relationship has actually gotten worse. Um, I'll talk about it in a minute, but um, a lot of that poor, um, the poor relations come out of this history of dispossession. So if we telescope out to look globally, one of the things we know by looking at um, global trends is that there is this global history of the production of conservation refugees, this term that comes out of Mark Dowie's book of the same name, um, this idea that um, people are kicked out of parks, they're evicted from parks and protected areas as those parks are built and expanded. And um, this is chronicled across uh, many parts of the world, but I think probably most um, influentially Sub-Saharan Africa and the safari parks like Kruger, and the parks in North America, particularly the US and Canada. And the US parks actually play a really pivotal role in the literature, and that's because the national park ideal that's really justified dispossession is developed in the US in the late 1800s around Yellowstone. Um, and then that model of the national park ideal that's developed in the US, it begins to spread globally and it, you know, it spreads to Sub-Saharan Africa, for example. And according to this wilderness model, um, it's the idea, the national park ideal model. It's a wilderness model of um, of nature, and this idea that if you create a national park, um, you go in and you create, you know, cordon off a piece of space, um, and then many times people living within that space are kicked out for that national park to exist. Um, these spaces are often characterized by wilderness as this aesthetic ideal, this ideal that national parks um, are places where nature can be left to exist in its, quote, pure, unadulterated state, kind of not harmed by people, not impacted by people. Um, and this feel of wilderness is what a lot of national parks and especially safari parks tap into, this idea that you know, you're gonna visit this people, this space that's, that's there for nature. And so um, this process of the creation of parks and displacing communities is part of a deeper history of settler colonialism, of settler colonial governments um, taking over land, dispossessing um, local people. And it reminds us that dispossession of local people, indigenous people, it's not like a sorry accident that happened with national parks um, and other protected areas, but written into the very fabric of those. Not all national parks, not all protected areas, but a lot of them um, have dispossession sort of written into their very DNA. And um, this then I think brings us back to this crisis of displacement um, that, that uh, protected areas and conservation practice itself has this long history of dispossession, of evicting local people, um, taking their land, uh, interfering with their access to natural resources, interfering with culturally important sites, um, and so forth. And that this has happened historically and it still very much happens today. Okay, so I wanna kind of add on to that a little bit to talk about, uh, this is like, a, there's a longer history of what I've just been talking about, but there's been two more recent developments um, that are important to mention here when we think about the second side of the biodiversity crisis. And the first is what we call neoliberal conservation. Um, and this, what we're seeing here um, is that this model of fortress conservation in which people shouldn't exist in parks and they should be forcibly evicted and kept out of them is really reinforced by neoliberal commitments. Um, and these commitments that protected areas should not only protect nature, 
but they they should also create uh, money, create financial opportunities for private investors and for states, um, because the assumption um, is that those protected areas need to pay for themselves and that they need to generate a profit for others. And so this has led to um, further rationales for displacement. And this was very explicit in the Limpopo National Park, um, where uh, primarily uh, private investors from South Africa um, were invited to invest in this park. And the idea was, um, if tourists are going to come, they want the authentic wilderness or safari experience. They don't want to see people living in the park. Uh, and so then it became another rationale for, for evicting people from the park. But again, this is a global trend. We're seeing this around the world. The second theme that I want to talk about in a bit more detail is green militarization. Um, and this goes into my own research as well. So I want to talk, uh, kind of walk through this a bit more slowly. And so to understand green militarization uh, and what that is, I'll give you a definition in a second. Um, we have to understand the rise of um, the illegal wildlife trade uh, and kind of the, not just the rise of it, because it's been around for a long time, but the intensification of the illegal wildlife trade beginning in around 2008. Um, in South Africa, that um, explosion of the illegal wildlife trade or commercial poaching really um, centered around the rhino horn trade, uh, the global uh, train and right, trade in rhino horns, where rhino horns would make their way primarily from South Africa, primarily from Kruger National Park, actually, because it's the world's most concentrated site of rhino protection. Um, rhinos would uh, be killed in Kruger, and then their horns would find their way uh, in the black market, the illegal wildlife trade, find their way primarily in Asia. And so this begins to take off in around 2008. You get a sense of the numbers here. Um, and how important South Africa is uh, within this context. And this has very much to do with the regional context because most of the men coming into Kruger to hunt rhino um, were, um, and in many cases still are, Mozambicans. Um, Mozambicans um, who are very poor uh, have a lot to gain financially. Um, it's very lucrative to enter into the illegal wildlife trade, but also have really good hunting skills. Um, and so they're quite good at what they do. And so a lot of young men coming into Kruger to hunt rhino, get the rhino horns, and then escape through Mozambique, where the environmental policies are pretty lax, and then the rhino horns can make their way um, off the continent. Well, South Africa, I think not surprisingly, um, was not pleased with this, um, you know, losing rhinos, having young men coming in with guns and so forth. And so they responded um, very quickly and very harshly to this um, threat. And they, res they responded in a militarized way. Um, and um, what I mean by green militarization here um, is this trend in which um, conservation actors and organizations begin to use um, military and paramilitary actors, techniques, technologies, and also partnerships in the pursuit of conservation. So this is what remilitarization is trying to capture. And at the time when I was doing the research, um, I, I thought this was sort of a South African thing, but didn't realize um, that it was a global trend. And we really began to see pretty quickly um, the militarization of conservation practice happening um, in many other parts of the world, much of it tied to the global illegal wildlife trade. And what green militarization looks like on the ground, both here in Southern Africa, but also globally, are things like um, the paramilitarization of the ranger force, where rangers are trained in increasingly paramilitary fashion uh, to be uh, much more closer to soldiers, for example. Um, we also see the explicit use of armies in conservation that happened here where the South African De Defense Force, which is the South African National Army, um, was brought in to defend the international border. Um, we also see partnerships with military corporations where military corporations um, are contracted out to provide military hardware, military services, and so forth to um, protect species. And also the language of war um, is really key to militarization and green militarization in this context, um, where we begin to see the language of, you know, for example, the war to uh, the war against biodiversity, the war to save rhinos, uh, and so forth. Um, and really the language of um, security where um, poachers um, coming in from Mozambique were often not framed as illegal hunters, which is technically what they are, um, but where the, the public um, and newspapers and even you know, military commanders working on anti-poaching efforts were starting to talk about poachers as insurgents, foreign insurgents coming in to infiltrate South African territory. 
And so we see the militarized language begin to um, come in and to shape conservation practice and the way conservation uh, challenges are framed. So the impact of green militarization, I think um, at this point we can say that green militarization has been somewhat effective in getting the poaching crisis under control. Um, other factors are relevant there as well. Um, but green militarization has also led to the death of hundreds of suspected poachers um, in the region. Um, and what you see here is a, a graveyard in the Mozambican borderlands that one of my colleagues took this photo. Um, and these graveyards are expanding in the region because so many young men have been shot and killed um, by rangers and by um, army members here uh, along the border and in, in South Africa. And this is a problem for many reasons I'll talk about. Um, but one just to mention now is that it's letting, it's like it's further entrenching this resentment um, that communities feel towards conservation and conservation projects. Um, because they're not only losing their land um, through displacement and relocation, um, but they're losing their sons and their grandsons and their nephews and so forth um, through these militarized practices. And again, just to point out, this isn't just a South African phenomenon. This is a global trend um, that we're seeing in many parts um, of Africa and Asia with this militarization of conservation practice. And so this is kind of, the, to summarize this section of the talk, this is, this is the crisis made by conservation. Uh, this is a crisis in which conservation practice has not only justified, but has orchestrated um, dispossession, has orchestrated uh, militarization, um, and it's led to really severe human rights violations, um, including in the most extreme form, the state orchestrated killings um, of perceived environmental transgressors, perceived, you know, posters and so forth. And so this is a deep crisis. And it's a crisis, not just on ecological grounds, which I'll get to in a second, but it's also a social and economic crisis. And especially if you think about these communities, for example, in Mozambique, uh, that are losing these young men who are involved in the illegal um, rhino horn trade, um, their death is a major blow to those communities. I remember a community leader telling me once that, you know, without those young men, because they're dead or they're in jail for 25 years, um, that the communities can't develop. Um, that they enter into a state of um, more intense poverty because of that. Um, and we've also done some research on what we call uh, the crisis of widows, looking at what the death of a poacher or his you know, long jail term, what that means for the widows that are left behind. Um, and in that region of Mozambique, it's extremely, it's water insecure anyways, but with climate change, things are getting worse. It's harder to eke out a living with agriculture. Um, and then these young women lose their husbands to the rhino horn trade um, at the hands of increasingly militarized conservation practice. Um, and they face a crisis of mere survival. Like how do you survive in a context like that? And so thinking about um, the deeper crises that get generated through these dispossessions and so forth. And then also, this is where I think that we do see a point of intersection across the two parts of the crisis of uh, biodiversity. And that's that um, there's in, in alienating people from conservation by dispossessing them, taking their land, but also by killing them, um, it contributes to the biodiversity crisis because you lose important allies that could be supporting the protection of biodiversity conservation, but um, either don't support it or outright um, are, and are, are aggressively against it because it's seen um, as a sign of, um, what's leading to poverty, because in many ways it is leading to more entrenched poverty and so forth. And so we get a sense here of, you know, the, the biodiversity practice is engaging um, in these um, dispossessions and other forms of exclusion, and that this is a crisis. It's a crisis for biodiversity, but it's also representative of a much deeper crisis. Okay, so the concept of crisis here before I get back to 30 by 30, um, just to mention that the concept of crisis is equally important in the more critical literature. So we saw how it's important to um, conservation biology uh, as a discipline. It's also really important to these more critical studies, but in a very different way. And that's because the critical literature does focus on crisis, but it looks how 
at how crisis narratives, the narrative, the stories about crisis, how these are used to justify um, exclusions and militarization and so forth. And the classic text here is Lie of the Land. Um, it came out in 1996, and it's really a huge uh, book in political ecology at this point. And what this um, group of uh, case studies did was to show how biodiversity practice would employ these crisis narratives, these narratives that local people are engaging in land degradation, they're overexploiting natural resources. Um, and so it would take these crisis narratives, they were often based on pretty poor science, um, and it would look at the ways in which those crisis narratives were used to justify dispossession. Um, and not only dispossess local people of their land and their resources, but the flip side of this is that those crisis narratives were used to consolidate control over those land and resources um, by the state, by uh, Western scientists and other experts, um, and increasingly by foreign investors. And so what this led uh, to was a context in which in the critical literature, folks are pretty weary of the use of crisis narratives. So when conservation biology talks about like, we're in a state of crisis, there's a little bit of skepticism of like, oh, well, we've seen where this is headed before. Um, so some skepticism around those crisis narratives. And I think that's where some of the, the not talking to one another in a truly productive way comes from is some of the skepticism um, of, of how those crisis narratives have been used to justify exclusion. When we look at green militarization, um, those crisis narratives are all over the place. These narratives of like, you know, the, the foreign infiltrator Mozambicans are coming into South Africa to steal natural resources and things like that. Um, but to show that these crisis narratives, they have real power um, in terms of justifying dispossession and so forth. Um, and so to think about a very different relationship to the concept of crisis when we think about the critical literature. Okay, so briefly, I want to talk about 30 by 30 again, and then I'm going to try to wrap up here um, by talking about how to move forward. So 30 by 30. So with the 30 by 30 campaign, again, this is the campaign for the global biodiversity agenda. Conservation really is at a crossroads and you have these mainstream debates, um, which again, I think are right saying there's an urgent problem here. We need a radical solution to stave off further biodiversity decline and to turn things around. And our best bet um, is something like 30 by 30, expanding protected areas, OECMs, um, and having a more concerted effort to conserve biodiversity. But critical perspectives of both academics, but also activist organizations have been brutally critical of 30 by 30. Um, and a really good example of this, um, which is quite representative actually of the critique uh, comes from Survival International that tells us that um, 30 by 30 is the biggest land grab in history. That 30 by 30, not only will it not address the biodiversity of the crisis, because it's based on the same old models that haven't worked before, but that it will further dispossess local and indigenous people and do so in very, very large numbers. And so Conservation International um, is working to stop 30 by 30. Um, precisely on these grounds that it will dispossess local indigenous people. And so um, this is the contentious debate. And the deeper question here is how do we move forward um, with biodiversity protection and how will indigenous and local peoples be incorporated into these projects? Will they be incorporated into them? And if so, how? Um, as kind of the source of land that can be taken over um, or as um, as partners and, and thinking about, you know, different types of relationships between conservation, uh, Western conservation, that is, um, and local and indigenous people. Okay, so as a way of kind of wrapping things up and takeaway points, I think that three important questions or points of, you know, um, contributions here are these. And the first one is the need to recognize that there is a dual crisis of conservation, that there is the crisis of biodiversity decline that we are in a very poor state when it comes to the protection of biodiversity. But this is coupled with the crisis of exclusion caused by con conservation. Um, and that um, we need a more holistic approach that takes both of these crises into account. Because if we don't do that, uh, we're missing a really big um, part of you know, the problem and what's going on. Um, this holistic approach 
needs to recognize that um, the protection of biological diversity or nature or um, however we want to frame that is needed for global survival um, and that those things are under imminent threat and our relationship to the natural world under imminent threat, but also recognizing that conservation is a powerful tool of spatial control. Um, it's a powerful tool, tool of uneven spatial control. It, conservation can come in and take over land, dispossess um, local people and so forth. And related to that, the very urgency of the crisis of biodiversity um, makes it more likely for dispossession and injustice to happen. So going back to that question of, of crisis and urgency. And so it raises this vital question of what um, an approach would look like, this more uh, holistic approach. And I, I simply don't have the answer here, um, but things that, that you know, I've been working on with a, a team of others um, suggest things like the needing to slow down, even in the face of urgency, slowing down to think about um, the long-term implications of conservation practice. You know, green militarization might solve the poaching crisis um, to some extent, but what are the long-term implications of that for trying to bring um, local support for conservation? Um, you know, will, can that happen in the context of green militarization even decades later? There's also a need for a rights-based approach to conservation that sees indigenous and local people as part of the solution and not um, the kind of root of the problem. Broader, more broadly, um, there's a need to decolonize conservation. Western conservation, um, in terms of its history, has been deeply colonial, part of this colonial project. Um, recognizing that, how do you decolonize conservation? And part of this is, you know, if you care for the land and you care for nature, you have to care also for the people that steward that. Um, but not just that, you have to care for their governance systems, um, care for their um, their worldviews and their knowledge systems and so forth, and not just in an instrumental way that that's, you know, you can borrow from that to make conservation better, but in a more substantive way. Um, one of the things I've written on a bit is you, there's also a need to address poverty and not just poverty, but the global, global inequality, the gap between the rich and the poor. The reason the rhino um, horn trade took off in part was because people willing to risk their lives were so intensely poor compared to uh, people who have um, the money to buy rhino horn on the black market that sells more on the black market than gold and cocaine do, um, pound for pound. So looking at the, the global distribution of wealth um, and thinking about how to address that in some really concrete ways. Um, I also think there's a need to look more deeply at race and gender dynamics. The history, the history of dispossession and ongoing dispossession are deeply racialized. Um, we know that. How do you address that? Um, but the same with gender, the fact that women experience biodiversity decline differently, and they also in, uh, experience um, measures aimed at protecting biodiversity differently that we see with, you know, for example, the crisis of widows. And so how do you bring gender and race analyses into this um, at the same time without losing sight of the fact that there is um, the reality of conservation decline um, and trying to take that seriously. And so I think one of the lessons here is that we need to think beyond the realm of conservation, because conservation is not going to solve global inequality. It's not going to solve um, these broader um, and broader questions around political economy and what an economic structure could look like that's not so dependent upon um, the exploitation of natural resources. And so the challenge is huge here. It's not just about reinventing conservation, but thinking about this broader transformative change, to use that term, um, that can support uh, conservation that is sustainable and also you know, socially just at the same time. So I think this is the dual crisis of conservation. Um, I kind of leave you with the question. <laughs> it's not too unsatisfying, but what the approach would look like, I think that's something we all need to answer together. It's something that um, not any one of us can do on our own. Um, so on that, I think I'll just close by saying thank you. Um, my email's here if you have questions that we don't get to today, but I really look forward to uh, hearing your input and the questions that you have and the insight that you have. Wow, thank you, Dr. Lundstrom. That was such a fantastic talk. It was super interesting. Um, I'd like to invite the audience to ask any questions. You can do that by just unmuting yourself and turning your camera on. We have a pretty small group, so 
that might be the preferred method, but if you want to type your question in the chat or use the raise hand function, you can do that as well. Um, I'll ask a question. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mallory. Um, my research is actually in Greenland, but it also, I work with Greenlandic Inuit people um, who have some of these issues of conservation um, crises as well. So I'm curious about this final point that your final takeaway. So what are other alternative governmental interventions that either the South African or Mozambique government um, has employed to intervene in the rhino horn trade that you know of? Like, what is an alternative if green militarization isn't working or hasn't been evaluated to show that it's helped conservation? What else has the government done? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think a lot of the um, debate on this comes, there's there's interesting parallels with the war on drugs. Um, and even that language is really militarized. <laughs> um, but I think the... I think everyone agrees. I mean, even people who are like the military commanders in charge of green militarization agree that the number one thing that has to happen is demand reduction. Because if there's no demand for rhino horn, the trade falls apart. And so that, but that's the global thing. That's like beyond the scope of Southern Africa. Um, so that is huge. I also think there's been some recognition that like, you know, from conservation actors that, okay, conservation has dispossessed local people. And maybe if we hadn't done that, this problem of um, commercial pushing wouldn't have taken off as it has. So I think there is, I mean, if there's kind of a silver lining to it, I think there is increased recognition that um, you have to take local people and their concerns seriously, because if you don't, it could backfire. But I think there's also a sense that maybe that's a, too little too late. That, yeah, you should have been thinking that in 1920 when Kruger decided to remove people. Um, so I there's I think there's a lot of kind of uncertainty on how best to move forward. So there's not like a one silver bullet that's going to solve that problem. I think it's going to take decades of kind of rebuilding those relationships. Um, I will say though, like globally, South a Southern Africa is actually quite far behind on this. Um, but globally, I think there's been a commitment to thinking about different models of conservation, like IPCAs, Indigenous Protected and Conserved Areas, that are based more on Indigenous peoples leading those projects and based on Indigenous governance systems and so forth. Um, but we see those more in Canada and Australia and other parts. Um, South Africa, from what I know, there's not a big focus on really substantively transforming conservation practice, but there is elsewhere. Thank you. Colleen, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Oh, okay. I'll ask it. Um, do, Colleen asks, do you think there's a role in the crisis for public, publicizing the expulsion of American Indian, Indians from national parks? Personally, I only learned about this 10 years ago from Yellowstone in Yosemite. Yeah, for sure. And I think that there's, that's the really interesting thing about 30 by 30 is I feel like the debates around it have provided this new platform for people to kind of stand up and scream like, we've long been dispossessed by conservation. Why do you think expanding conservation areas are going to solve the problem when they've been part, you know, they've been driving this other problem. And so um, I think there is more recognition of that. And there's also, it's just more in the public sphere. Um, some of you probably saw the article a few months ago in the Atlantic that David Troyer wrote. Um, and basically he argues that the United States government needs to give the national parks back to um, the tribes in the US and a hugely controversial claim. But the fact that he can write that in a journal like the Atlantic and it's generated a lot of discussion I think the moment is different today than it was five or 10 years ago uh, to have that discussion uh, around this history of dispossession. Um, but also I feel like the organizations are changing, like the National Park Service is more open to that critique. Uh, and it's also trying to rectify some of that history. So there's been like organizational change uh, 
um, as well as just change in public um, kind of recognition. Although I will say, as someone who spent 12 years in Canada um, and then came back to the US, that debate is much more public and much more robust in Canada uh, than it is in the US. And I think that has to do with the history of, um, of reconciliation in Canada, that the government has an official platform on reconciliation that we don't have in the US. I have another question if nobody else does. <laughs> um, Libby, so um, this is kind of a methods thing. So when you're engaging with these people who have been dis dispossessed or communities who have been dispossessed, is that language, does that language come up like in interviews and in discussion? What is the framework for thinking about these issues from the standpoint of the people who have been affected um, by the conservation land dispossession? Do they use that, that terminology? Is there that kind of like historical mentality? Yes, like very explicitly. And I think there the language um, is often around sacrifice um, and the language, because Mozambique had a really, really, one of the worst like civil wars in recent history from 1977 to 1992. Like a million people were killed and a third of the country was displaced. It was really, really horrible. And it's very fresh in people's minds. And so um, a lot of the language around that um, is people saying, look, I sacrificed, like, look, government, I sacrificed for you. I, I fought for my country. I lost my brother. Um, I, you know, my house was burned down and I sacrificed. And now this is how you repay me by you stealing my land and that you love the animals more than you love us. And so that, that language of sacrifice, um, I think, was really huge. The other part, I didn't have time to get into this, but the for many of those communities that are being displaced from the park, that's their third um, relocation in like 40 years. The first one was because of the war. Um, no, actually that's the second one. The first one was because a dam was built um, that flooded their, uh, their homes. And so they had to move upland. And then with the war, they had to move out completely. And then now with the park, they're being asked again. And so there's also this, this um, language of sacrifice, but also just exhaustion. Like, can you leave us alone? <laughs> We've had enough. And I think that's maybe somewhat particular to Mozambique, but maybe not. I mean, because if you look at the people who are dispossessed from protected areas, they're often the poor and the vulnerable who often have to make sacrifices for um, these big national development projects and conservation projects. But I think it's a great question. Like, how do they understand it? <laughs> not just how, how do we as scholars come in and understand it? Definitely, thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Do we have any more questions? Okay, well, I, encourage everyone to unmute themselves and give a round of applause to Dr. Lundstrom for such a fantastic talk. Yeah, thanks everyone. Appreciate it. All right. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks for coming to the rough cut. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Bye Libby. Thank you.